Okay, we are in Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And we read, we read, we actually studied through, through, uh, verse, verse 8 and verse 9 of, of, uh, 8, 9, and 10 last time. But let's just start reading again from 11, Romans chapter 11, verse 7, just to recap a little bit. What then? What Israel is seeking, it has not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not, and ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David said, let their table become a snare and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not, and bend their backs forward. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be. But by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? But I am speaking to you who are Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am an apostle of Gentiles, I've magnified my ministry. If somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save some of them. For if their rejection is reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Okay, so in, in chapter 11, verse, verse uh, uh, 8, we covered that it is, it, well, in verse 7, it says that what Israel is seeking, it has not obtained, but those who were chosen obtained it. Those who were chosen... There is a chosen. So among Israel, there is Israel at large, and there is a remnant among Israel. There is a subset among Israel, and that's what he was speaking of. He says they were the ones who obtained it, that subsection. And it is the same, that there will always be a remnant. And as he had said in verse 1 of chapter 11, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am am an Israelite descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. So what he was saying, God has not rejected Israel. You talk to some Christians today, you'll say, has God uh, superseded Israel with the church? They'll say yes. Paul says no. They say yes. Paul says no. Guess who's right? And and uh, uh, God still has a plan for Israel. And and Paul says says that, that there's no way that Israel has been rejected. And then, and so then he, he, he talks about how this spirit of stupor came over them in verse 8. God gave them the spirit of stupor. And, and uh, uh, there was a hardening from God that came upon them. Now let's start reading in verse 11. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall. Did they? May it never be. Again, he's saying Israel has not stumbled so as to fall. Yes, they stumbled, but they have not fallen away. There is going to be a remnant. He says, if they stumble in in order that they would fall, and he says, may it never be the strongest Greek negation. It's not happening. It's not happening. There is a plan for Israel. That's what he's saying. There's a plan here for Israel. He says, by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. Salvation has come to the Gentiles... By their transgression, because of Israel's transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. This whole thing of jealousy, this is something that is clear in the Word of God, that that, uh, um, uh, that, that God talks about uh, in, in the Scriptures, that, that uh, uh, He clearly says... In, for example, in Deuteronomy 32.21, it says, Deuteronomy 32.21, They have made me jealous. God is saying they have made me jealous with what is not God. They have promo- provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. And I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. God says, I'm going to take them and I'm going to... I'm going to make them jealous. You make me jealous, I'll make you jealous. Remember what we talked about last time? God visits us blessing for blessing in kind, curse for curse in kind. He does that. He jeal- he, he, and, and so when you give, when you give of your money, you get more money. That's what it is. You give of your food, you get more food. He blesses in kind. He also curses in kind. You're going to make me jealous, I'm going to make you jealous. That's what he told them. He said, I'm going to make you jealous by those who are not a people. The church is not a people. The Gentile, it spreads across all countries. He says, I'm going to make you jealous by them. 
So he said he would do it, and he's doing it. Most Jews, most Jews that come to the Lord, come to the Lord through Gentile witness. I came to the Lord through Gentile witness. I'm a Jew, came to the Lord through Gentile witness. People contact me, oh, you gotta, you gotta share with my Jewish friend. I mean, if he hears a Jew, then he'll get saved. I said, I'm glad to share with your Jewish friend. But God has made you to speak to him. God made you to do it. He made the Gentile to do this. I was so impressed with, with, with Christians when I started meeting them when I went to college. I was attracted to their faith when I saw their devotion, their love, their turning to the scriptures all the time. I was most impressed by the things that they laughed at. They, it never seemed to be that in groups they were laughing at somebody. They were just laughing together. They weren't laughing at somebody. All of us have been on the brunt of that laughter. And it's painful. And so they were very different in many ways, and I appreciated them. And so he says that I'm going to make them jealous through the Gentiles. He says, now, if their transgression is riches for the world, and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? He says, if their transgression is riches for the world, and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? In other words... Uh, so we're in Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, verse 12. Now, if their transgression is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be? So so he's saying that, that their transgressions has become riches for the Gentiles and the world has been blessed. This is exactly what what... The Lord told Abraham in, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. He said, through your family, every family in this world is going to be blessed. And we know that that's happened because Jesus has been an absolute blessing to the world. If it were not for Jesus, we would have been wiped out long ago. But also you see this in, in, in the worldly realm. So let me give you some statistics. So there's, there's 15 million Jews in the world. There's 15 million Jews and there's 7.8 billion people in the world. So you've got 15 million Jews, 7.8 billion. That is 0.19%. 0.19%. So roughly 0.2% of the world is Jews. That's it. 0.2%. 22% of the Nobel Prizes have been won by the Jews. What's going on? You say, well, they've been, you, you, you know, they're privileged. Oh, really? They're privileged? Did you know that two-thirds of European Jewry was wiped out in World War II? Killed. Wiped out. Systematically wiped out. One-third of all Jews in the world, one-third of all Jews on planet Earth were killed during World War II. In spite of that, in spite of that, you just see this explosion of blessing to the world through these people. It is absolutely inexplicable without the hand of God. It cannot happen without the hand of God being there. It's just amazing. And and God said that he would do it. Remember, the universe conforms to God's word. We don't, you know, in science, we chase the universe trying to figure it out. God speaks and the universe just conforms to what his word says. This had to happen because he said it would happen. He says if there's going to be a blessing to the world through these people and through their disobedience, I'm going to take the Gentiles and make these people jealous. And he said the same thing back in in chapter 10 of Romans, verse 19. He says, but I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? First Moses said, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding, I will anger you. So he turns them. He turns them to the Lord. And uh, then verse 13, he says, And I am speaking to you who are Gentiles. Now he's going to speak to the Gentiles. He says, Inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. He says, I'm an apostle of the Gentiles. God has sent me, a Jew, to be an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry if somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen. That means my in, in, the, the literal is they're my flesh countrymen, my fellow Jews, if I might move them to jealousy and save some of them. He says, I love my ministry because I see Gentiles converted to the faith. And after they've been converted, they convert the Jews. That's why I love my ministry. 
I love it. He says, I magnify my ministry. I magnify my ministry. This guy loved his ministry because remember, this was the guy who said, I will give up my salvation if my fellow countrymen could be saved. That's how much he wanted to see them saved. You see the heart of this man. You see the heart. He said, it is my it, it, it is my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them for their salvation. My heart's desire and my prayer to God for them for their salvation. I don't see people coming to the Lord by just praying for their salvation. I don't. For years I did that. I didn't see people coming to the Lord. It had to become my heart's desire. When I started to pray, God, get a hold of my heart and make me long to see people saved. Make it my heart's desire. You couple that with prayer, boom, people start getting saved. I tell this to everybody and they say, what verses do you use? You don't get it. You don't get it. You think you're going to use these verses. It's going to happen. It's not. You've got to have the heart's desire. And I say, it's not that. It, it, okay, well, what approach do you use? I just said it. You pray to God, give me a heart's desire, a longing to see people saved. That's what brings them to the Lord. It's not the methodology. You go to any evangelistic seminar, it's all methodology. Use this verse, use this illustration, use this. That's not what does it. It's your heart's desire. Coupled to the prayer, and then you see salvations. This is the guy who said, I love my ministry. I love it. You know, in... in, in uh, there, there, there's this, this verse in, in Ecclesiastes about loving one's work. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, it says this, There is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself <clears throat> that his labor is good. This also I have seen, that it is from the hand of God. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? There's nothing better for a man than to eat and drink <clears throat> and tell himself that his labor is good. I love my work. I love it. <clears throat> I love what I do. That doesn't mean I love every aspect of it. You know, I still got to write proposals and do things like that. But, but I love what I do. I love the work that I do. And this is a blessing from God. I meet a lot of people that don't love their work. I'll tell you, it, and I prayed for my kids even before they were born that God would give them careers that they love. And thankfully, all my kids, go figure, God answers prayer. They love what they're doing. It is a wonderful thing to love what you're doing. I also love my ministry. I love being able to share with young people about the faith. I love it. I love sharing with people about the Lord. I love it. Paul loved his ministry. He says, I magnify. I glorify my ministry. I magnify it. I magnify my ministry, Paul says. It is a good thing to enjoy your ministry. If you're doing something in ministry and you really don't like it, look around for something else because God can give you a ministry that you love. It doesn't mean that it's easy, but it is a labor of love. It can be very hard. It can take a lot out of you, but it is a labor of love. Try something else in the church. You know, for example, I mean, if I had to work in the nursery, that would be like working... In, in hell for me. I mean, I, I hate working with little kids. I can't imagine the thought of changing somebody else's kid's diapers. But then there's people who do that and they love it. They're fine with it. And God has a different role for everybody. You find that place where, where, where you, you really start, can, you, you can really start ministering and plugging in. But God does this and He says, He says, so what happens is, is the Jews, the, the, the Jews don't receive, so God makes Gentiles, God makes Gentiles, into people of faith to make the Jews jealous, to bring the Jews in. And then what happens? So then you read in in verse 15, For if their rejection is reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Whoa, that's amazing. So the Jew rebellion makes the Gentiles get saved. The Gentiles getting saved brings the Jews into the kingdom. The Jews coming into the kingdom bless the Gentile world such that they get life from the dead. They're resurrected from the dead. I mean, his ways are higher than our ways. He's just amazing. God is amazing. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts, it says in Isaiah 58. His ways are higher than our ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great are his ways than our ways. If our thoughts are better than the earthworm, his thoughts are... The delta is bigger between his thoughts and our thoughts. 
God uses the Jews to bring in the Gentiles. The Jews' rebellion brings in the Gentiles. The Gentiles then bring in the Jews. The Jews then affect the world such that the Gentiles are going to get resurrected from the dead. That's what it says. All of this was in God's plan. You haven't, you have, yet God has not been surprised by any of this. All of this, all of it is in God's plan. Every bit of it. God does this. God does all of this. It's all in His plan. So for example, The scriptures say in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, that the Lamb of God has been slain from the foundation of the world. Huh? I thought thought the Lamb of God was slain in the first century. Yeah, he was. But the whole plan was given since the foundation of the world. Before the world was, before any of us was around, before there was anything. The Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. God knew this was His plan from the beginning. It wasn't like this was plan B because Adam messed up. No way. You didn't take God by surprise. This is not plan B. This has been plan A all the time. The Lamb of God was slain from the foundation of the world. This was always the way that He was going to do it. That Lamb of God was slain from the foundation of the world. You know, in, in, in Judaism, there's the, these, these, this idea of two different types of messiahs. There's going to be Messiah, son of Joseph, and Messiah, son of David. Messiah, son of David. Messiah, son of Joseph, and Messiah, son of David. And so you see these two different types of messiahs, and the Jews rationalize this saying, there must be two messiahs because they're so distinct. But we know it that it's one Messiah coming on two different visits. His first time, he is Messiah, son of Joseph, that who is go- the one who is going to appeal to his brothers. The next time, he's going to be jo- uh, Messiah, son of David, son of David, who is going to be the one who is the reigning king. That's how we know it. <clears throat> and so you can see this. You can see this in his plan all the time. Let's go through Joseph, the life of Joseph. We studied this in the last book we studied. But think about the life of Joseph. Joseph is this, this picture of Christ. He is this type of Christ. Joseph was the only beloved of his father. I'm, I'm going to just show you how this was all planned out. God was not surprised. Joseph was, was the only beloved of his father. Jesus was the only beloved of his father. Joseph was sent to his brothers to bring them word from the Father. Jesus was sent to the world, to his people, to his own people, to Israel, to bring them a word from the Father. Joseph was abused by his brothers and sold into slavery by his brothers. They sold him for 20 pieces of silver into slavery. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. He was sold. Joseph was bound when he was put into slavery. It says he was bound. Jesus, in Matthew 27, was bound. Who who turned over Jesus? It was Judas. Judas. Judas is the Greek name, the Greek way that you say Judah. Whose idea was it to sell Joseph into slavery? Judah's idea. They, they, it's the same name, right down to the same name. Judas is in Greek, Judah is in, is in Hebrew. Right down to the same name. They are, they, they are both condemned in an unfair trial. They are both condemned and they are both, bo- both sentenced. When they, when they are condemned, Jesus is, is condemned alongside two other people. One was crucified on his left and the other on his right. When Joseph was condemned, he was put in prison and two other officials joined him. The baker and the, the, the uh, uh, cupbearer. Concerning the baker, he was killed. The cupbearer was promoted and he was given life. Of the two men that were crucified with Jesus, one was in hell forever, the other was with Jesus that very day. Do you see how God had all of this in mind? He mapped it all out. Uh, 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 they rose from a place of condemnation to a place of glory in a single day. Joseph went from prison to the side of Pharaoh in a single day. Jesus went from death to reigning at, at the right hand of his father in a single day. With Joseph, they brought the, the, the tunic that was covered with blood to substantiate that that was Joseph's tunic. With, with, that was jo- Joseph's tunic. With, with Jesus, they brought the shroud covered in bl- blood. That, that shroud covered in blood was the testimony. Jesus was here. The same sort of thing. 
Joseph was promoted to the right hand of Pharaoh, Jesus to the right hand of the Father. Before Joseph, every knee had to bow. Before Jesus, every knee has to bow. Um, uh, in glory, when, when, when Joseph was glorified and promoted, he took a Gentile bride. When Jesus was glorified, he took a Gentile church as his bride. I mean, you see, you haven't fooled God. Everything was absolutely lined up. I mean, God's just saying, it's me. It's me. It's all here. He's telling the Jewish people, it's all here. When Jesus <clears throat> appears and he comes and he, he, he reveals himself to his brethren, to his Jewish brethren, he weeps over them. He weeps over their lack of receipt of him. He looks over Jerusalem and he weeps and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered your, chick, your children as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you would not have it. He weeps over them. When Joseph first sees his brothers, and he, he starts weeping on that first visitation to his brothers. And he has to, 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 to hide himself because he's weeping just like Jesus wept over his brothers. You see, you, you, you see that, that, that this whole thing, that, that Joseph then reveals himself to his brothers. Jesus revealed himself to his brethren. And then there is going to be a second revelation. What happened on the second revelation to, uh, of Joseph to his brothers? On the second revelation, the, the, the things that occurred... Here in, in, in the book of Genesis, um, uh, he reveals himself now a second time to his brothers. And so you see that, that um, uh, when Joseph, it says in, in, in Genesis chapter 45, verse 14 and 15, uh, I'm sorry, it, verses 1 through 5, it says, Then Joseph could not control himself for, for all who stood by him. And he cried, Have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it, heard of it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer. And they came closer. And he said, I'm your brother Joseph. You sold me into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here f- for God sent me before you to preserve life. And then later on in the book of Genesis, he says, he says, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. And that's exactly, exactly what happened. They meant it evil for Jesus, but God had a plan, had a plan for them. And then in verse 14 of of Genesis 45, it says, then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and he wept. He wept and Benjamin wept on his neck and he kissed all his brothers and wept on them. And afterward, his brothers talked with him. You see, on the second revealing to his brothers, they all wept together. That is exactly what it says in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. The next time that Jesus comes, he is going to return. And it tells us when he comes as Messiah, son of David, on his next coming, it says in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, I will pour out my on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication, so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns as for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. The same way his brothers and he wept together, they will all weep together when Jesus returns again, and they will weep that they are the ones who strung up this guy on the cross and had him nailed to the cross. You see that that what, what they meant for evil, God meant for good. But what's really telling in this, what's really telling in this is that is that in, in Genesis, we read it in Genesis chapter 45. What did he do? He says, before he revealed himself to all his brothers, what did he do? He says, have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Have them all go out. He sent the Gentiles away. I want you to look back. Look back in Romans. Romans chapter uh, 11. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. He says, he says, verse 15, Romans 11, verse 15, For if their rejection is reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? What is this life from the dead? You mean that when the Gentiles receive this, there's going to be life from the dead? I'm sorry, when the Jews receive this, there's going to be life from the dead for the Gentiles? That could well speak of the rapture could well speak. He's going to take that Gentile church. He's going to package them up and just send them away. The rapture will come because we know in the book of Revelation that in that time of travail, in that time of travail, 
I, in that time of travail, that he is going to come and he's going to reveal himself to his brethren and they're going to be weeping. There's something, something, life from the dead for the Gentiles. When, when uh, uh, it says, for if their rejection, meaning Israel's rejection, is reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Joseph sent away all the Gentiles before he revealed himself to his brothers. There is going to be life from the dead. What is this resurrection? What is the, 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 this rapture? Is this really scriptural? Absolutely is. First Thessalonians 4.13. 1 Thessalonians 4.13. It says this, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, meaning dead. Asleep is the code word in the New Testament for people who knew God but had passed away. He did not consider them dead. He always spoke of them as asleep. He said, he said, Lazarus is asleep. He said, the girl is asleep. And they laughed at him. When he said, Lazarus is asleep, his disciples said, well, if he's asleep, he'll wake up. And Jesus said, you know, he's dead. That's kind of the code word. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. First Thessalonians 4, 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For if the Lord himself, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then those who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. So what's going to happen? What exactly it says here, he says, this is a word from the Lord. This is not me speaking, this is the Lord. What it says is that is that uh, um, when the Lord returns, there's going to be a shout from the ar- a voice of the archangel, there's going to be a trumpet that's going to be blown, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. This is the first resurrection, the dead in Christ. Those who died in Christ. This is not the Old Testament saints. There's another resurrection for them. But the dead in Christ will rise first. And as they're going up, then those who are alive in Christ are going to be taken up with them in the air. And and this is exactly what's going to happen. This is exactly... And you say, well, that's hard to believe. Okay, well, it's hard to believe. This is what the Word of God says. I'll bet you something. I'll bet you something. You live your whole life, don't believe it. This will still happen. This will still come true. This will be found right, you will be found wrong. You don't need to believe this to be saved. What you got to believe is Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. That's what you got to believe. All this other stuff, you don't need for salvation. But you need this if you want to grow. And he says, he says in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again... Even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Christ. As sure as we are that Jesus Christ has died and risen again, there's so much evidence for his resurrection. Piles and piles of evidence. Again and again, eyewitnesses, both in biblical accounts and extra-biblical accounts, talking about this resurrection of Jesus Christ. So much information on this. He died, he rose again. He says, as sure as this, those in Christ are going to rise from the dead. You see this. I don't know if for sure if, if in Romans chapter 11, this, this rising from the dead, life from the dead, when they accept there's going to be life from the dead, if that speaks of the, re, uh, of, of, of the, the, this first resurrection, if that speaks of the rapture. But it's interesting. You see the parallels between Joseph and between Jesus. And Jesus fulfilled all of these things. You see, this is, this is just, nothing has surprised God. It is all here. I mean, to those of you who don't know the Lord, I just urge you, I just urge you to know Him. When Jesus came into Nazareth, uh, uh, um, He went into the synagogue. It says in, in Luke chapter 4, He went into the synagogue as was His custom. And he, and he stood up to read. The book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to Him in Luke chapter 4, verse 17. And He opened the book and He placed went to the place where it was written. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. He's quoting from the prophet Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set those who are, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. 
and he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant. You know what this man did? Do you know what he did? He chopped that verse right in half. He just cut it in half. He just cut it in half. He didn't finish the verse. He didn't finish it. He cut it in half. He, 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 right in the middle of this thing, he stopped. Because there's another verse that goes on. There's another verse that goes on in the, in the prophet Isaiah. Um, so if I read to you that whole prophecy, just a little bit more of the prophecy from Isaiah 61, here's how it goes. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has set me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. He left out and the day of vengeance of our God because his first coming, he was coming in the model of Joseph. He came to reveal himself to his brothers the first time. The second time he comes, he'll come in the model of King David. It'll be different. When Jesus stood up and he read in the synagogue, he said, I'm stopping right here. It was a very odd place to stop when he's reading from the prophet Isaiah. A very odd place to stop because he cut that verse right in the middle. He cut that sentence right in the middle. But the next time he comes, he'll fulfill the second part of that prophecy. We know it. It is so sure. It is absolutely going to happen. The scriptures testify of it over and over again. Jesus is the best, the best, the best in every way. He's coming again. He comes in the model of Joseph and he weeps over us and he longs for us. And then he goes and he saves the Gentile church. I mean, yes, there's, it's just a fraction of the Gentiles that are being saved, but it is a huge fraction. And a lot of them. If you look at, at the world right now, the world right now is about 30% claim Christianity. That's a very high number. And so you want to take a remnant of that. It's still a big number. The number of Jews in the world today, remember, is 0.2%. And he's saving a remnant of that. A remnant. It's, it's believed there's about 150,000 Messianic Jews in the world. So 1%. What is the remnant of this 30% of the Gentiles? You think he's been good to the Jews? I think he's been pretty good to the Gentiles, actually. He's been really good to the Gentiles. The number of people he's reached out to among them. To choose them. To, to have them saved. This is what's going on. He's the best in every way. If you don't know him, I urge you this day to pray, Lord, receive me. Lord, forgive me for my sins and come into my life. You've got to talk to me. You give me 30 minutes, you will get saved. Just give me 30 minutes. Give me 30 minutes with you. If you're listening online, you just contact me. Send me an email uh, to tour at drjamestour.org. And, and uh, um, you, you, you just, just send me that, that email and I will get it and I'll meet, set up a time to meet with you. If you're here today, you just come and talk to me today. And, and uh, uh, we, we, just, we just deal with it today. And you'll get saved today. You don't, you don't have to go any longer than this day to get saved. You will get saved this very day. You just come and talk to me if you don't know the Lord. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word. And Father, I pray for those here who do not know you. I pray, Lord, for their salvation, that they would come to know you this very day. And Lord, I pray for those who know you, that they would walk out of this place with a deeper greater understanding of the Word of God, seeing that this has been your plan all along because the Lamb of God has been slain since the foundation of the world. This has always been your plan. Lord, I thank you. I thank you because nothing can stop your plan. I thank you, Lord, that you have chosen us. You have reached down and chosen us. By your mercies, you have done that. And Father, I pray for those here today that know you that they would trust you and trust your word all the more. For the glory of Jesus, your grace and your strength be poured out upon us for your glory, that Jesus would be glorified in and through our lives, that Jesus would be glorified through. Lord, use us. And Lord, I pray that you would use these Gentiles and use their lives and their love for you to be a real witness to the Jews, that Jews would come to know the Lord through them, because this has been your purpose all along that through their lives that the Jews would come to know you. Thank you, Lord God. Blessed be your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.